Good morning, and thank you for joining us for 10 minutes to discuss how you can support well-being within your team. I'm Carolyn Kumsty Fowler from the Office of Wellbeing, and I'm delighted to be joining my colleague, Dr. Rich Safia, on this journey. Rich, the Healthy at Hopkins team, and I hope you enjoyed your Thanksgiving wherever you were. We are thankful for the gift of your time and presence with us each and every week. Today, we'll continue our exploration of the social climate or morale building block of well being. And that's an important theme uh, in, in our work in well being. And a deep, important theme within social climate is fostering a sense of community. So after I introduce what we mean by a sense of community, we'll discuss how sharing with our colleagues can strengthen our sense of community. This definition is from Macmillan and Chavez in 1986, and their theory of social community has been used globally and widely validated. They define a sense of community as a feeling that members have of belonging, a feeling that members matter to one another and to the group, and a shared faith that members' needs will be met through their commitment to be together. As many of us know, the last 21 months have both challenged our sense of community and connection, and in some cases, they've strengthened it. And the key here is that when we understand what contributes to a sense of community, we're more able as leaders to influence it positively. Now, it may be most helpful as we talk today for you to think of your group, the group that you manage or lead as a community. So according to Macmillan and Chavez, a sense of community can be broken down into four elements. The first is membership, and that's about who is included in the community, feels safe within the community, identifies as belonging to that community, feels a personal investment in the community, and shares some sort of common symbol system, such as our uniforms or logos or unit or team identity. The second element is influence. And this includes the belief that my voice counts. When you speak, others listen and may often act on your input. But influence also includes community members' willingness to listen and learn from other people in the community. The third element is fulfillment of needs. People belong to communities to satisfy one or more needs. In a community of practice like ours in healthcare, a common need may be to succeed and learn and grow professionally but it may also include needs such as doing meaningful work or being part of a mission-driven team. Sometimes it feels like our healthcare family. The fourth element is emotional connection. This includes having a shared history with the community as well as identification with that history. It also includes a felt sense of connection between individual community members. Now, Macmillan and Chavez suggest that this may seem like the most elusive and nebulous, perhaps tenuous element of sense of community. It's often harder to address, but it is very, very important. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So sharing can be a powerful tool for creating a sense of connection within your work community. Although sharing can support all four elements of the sense of community, we'll focus today on the power of sharing personal experiences to strengthen our emotional connections to the work community. Now it's important to emphasize that while personal sharing can be a powerful tool for emotional connection, if it's done well, it's a practice that we must approach with care. So let's transition now to talk about how as leaders we can support sharing in ways that are both caring and constructive. Let's be very clear about what is not included in caring sharing. Gossip of any kind, ever. Let me repeat that. Gossip is not caring sharing. In fact, it often destroys emotional connection quickly and for a long time. Sharing can be between individuals or small groups, but it cannot become exclusionary sharing that leaves certain team members feeling unwanted or unwelcome or unvalued. So as leaders, we cannot allow a clique culture to develop in our teams. Now, occasionally sharing can be emotionally triggering. That may happen intentionally when people intend to provoke or upset others or push people's buttons, but mostly it's much, much more likely that it's going to be triggered unintentionally. And so, and so as we think about sharing, we want to do no harm. Now, often this is why leaders 
avoid personal sharing. They feel that it's risky, but the key, key here for us today is to learn to do it well. I really appreciate this definition of respect from the Center for Creative Leadership. At its core, respect is a continuous process of paying attention to people. Whenever we are sharing, we should be paying attention without judgment to people. Remember that it's important to respect boundaries. There are some things people may choose not to share and some topics that we may as a group decide that we don't want to share. Respect the need for emotional safety. People may feel vulnerable if asked to share. And the key is that everyone should know that sharing is their choice and is never going to be a requirement. And this connects deeply to the respect for people's right to privacy. Respect for people's unique lived experience and their history is very important. For example, why many of us you know, enjoy holidays celebrated with family and friends, you know, for others, holidays may be associated with loss or sadness, and we never know that. So by this point, you may be thinking, okay, Carol, and sharing is just too complicated or risky. We're not gonna do this one. I agree that it may not be easy, at least at first, but the challenge is that if we avoid sharing personal things with our teams, we avoid a powerful opportunity to develop social connection. So let's look at some ways that we can share safely. Be invitational, not prescriptive about sharing. Ask if anyone would like to share. Don't single out people and put them on the spot. Be willing to share yourself. That's sometimes hard, but get comfortable with the things that you're willing to share and perhaps the things that you're not willing to share. You don't have to share everything, but let's practice finding what we are willing to share. Lean towards sharing positive experiences, preferably accessible experiences, such as would anyone like to share something that made you smile or laugh yesterday or this weekend? Pick the time frame; it doesn't matter. Is there something you're looking forward to? What's your favorite healthy holiday treat? And here's another caution. When we ask people to share their favorite holiday or life experience and people tell us about these fantastic holidays they went on, we may unintentionally introduce the challenge of privilege because some of our colleagues may not have the time or resources or flexibility to enjoy similar experiences. And always friends, let's be listening to what is said or what is not being said during sharing. Last but not least, I'd like to offer these resiliency focused reflection questions that are inspired by the work of Elaine Miller Karras, who's author of the Community Resiliency Model. These can be answered individually but may also be inspiring when the answers are shared within your group. So as I read through these, I invite you to pick one of these to reflect on yourself today or even after this session. What or who are you grateful for? What or who uplifts you? What or who gives you strength? And what or who helps you get through hard times? Sometimes in answering that, you'll find a smile coming to your face. So here are two tips about the practice of sharing. The first I have for you is to commit to sharing something personal daily. If you're not sharing at all yet, maybe break it in once or twice a week. But if sharing is not hard for you, try to do it daily. A great place to start is with your well-being practices, with something you're grateful for, or something that inspired you. The agenda tip is to encourage sharing as part of meetings, possibly as an opening or closing activity. An example might be, what's one good thing that's happened to you today? Or perhaps at the end, what's something you're grateful for as you sat here today? And of course, we'll have many more suggestions as we go through this series. Thank you for joining us today. Please share your feedback by answering the two questions in the link that Tara has put in the chat. Next week, Dr. Safir will discuss the importance of our word choices on social climate and morale. And we hope you'll join us for that and invite a colleague. We invite you to connect with us at Healthy at Hopkins in the Office of Wellbeing. And of course, if there's something you want to see that you don't find there, please let us know and we'll do our best to get that up for you. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>